Um, yes, Tyler, that's fine. I'm just getting your message. Can you come to lab today? If you can come to lab today, Tyler, that would be great if you can do that. All right, so here we are, chapter 13, blood vessels. Um, your blood vessels we divide into kind of two classes, pulmonary vessels, which transport blood from the right ventricle uh, to the heart and through the lungs and back to the left atrium. So pulmonary vessels have everything to do with getting blood to and from the lungs. And systemic vessels are all the vessels that transport blood from your left ventricle of the heart through all of the parts of the body, the body systems, and then back to the right atrium. So that is how we kind of separate out the two classes of blood vessels. And here are specific blood vessel functions. And again, when we talk blood vessels, we're talking about arteries, veins, capillaries, and we'll go over those. But functions of blood vessels, they carry your blood, they exchange nutrients, waste product, gases within tissues, especially at the capillary level. They transport other substances, they regulate blood pressure, so your blood vessels can constrict and dilate to control how much blood flows through them to regulate blood pressure. And your blood vessels can direct blood flow to certain tissues that need them more. So for example, during exercise, your blood vessels will dilate to allow more blood to get to your skeletal muscles and less blood flow to go to your digestive tract, for example. Vessel structures, we have arteries that always carry blood away from the heart. They are very thick with a lot of elastic fibers in them so they can stretch. Veins carry blood toward the heart and their walls are much thinner with less stretch or less elastic. And then capillaries, these are the teeny tiny blood vessels where gas exchange, nutrient exchange, any other exchange that occurs between substances in the blood and the tissue that surrounds that blood. Blood flow through capillaries. Um, and so we have the blood arterials flow into capillaries. So if we kind of start with blood vessels themselves, um, or arteries themselves, arterials will always kind of turn into capillaries. Capillaries will turn into venules. Venules turn into small veins, and then veins will eventually return all blood flow to the heart. And we'll go over the specific blood flow as it occurs throughout the body. Before we get into that, we'll talk a little bit about the tunic layers or the tissue layers that make up your blood vessel walls. So um, a tunic or a tunica is just a layer, and we have three tunics or layers that make up the walls of our blood vessels. And they're the same, um, they look a little different in arteries and veins, but they're the, named the same. The tunica intima is the innermost layer. It's a very thin layer of simple squamous epithelium cells. The tunica media layer is your middle layer that's made up of smooth muscle with elastic and collagen fibers. So in your tunica media, this will be the muscle layer that controls constriction of blood vessels getting smaller and then dilation of blood vessels as they dilate to allow more blood flow through them. And then the tunica adventitia layer is the outermost layer of the blood vessel. It's made up of connective tissue and it usually helps to anchor that blood vessel to the surrounding tissue around it. So there are our three types of tunics, the tunica intima, the tunica media and the tunica adventitia layer going from um, kind of superficial or I should say kind of deep to superficial. The intima is the innermost layer of the lumen. The media is the inner middle muscular layer and the adventitia is this outer layer of connective tissue. And I really like this picture of the light microscope showing the differences between an artery that's labeled A and a vein labeled B. And that's because you see really clear differences. Arteries always have thicker walls um, with a lot more elastic tissue and the veins have much thinner walls. Veins usually can collapse on themselves 
and arteries always maintain kind of the shape for the lumen and the blood to flow through. So that's just a, um, a look at an artery in a vein under a microscope. So let's go through arteries first of all. And if you're joining us, we're in blood vessels, chapter 13. Um, we'll get through just about half this PowerPoint today. So I'm gonna go up to about slide 40 and then we'll finish this um, the PowerPoint on Monday with your next lecture exam on chapters 10 to 13 a week from today on Wednesday. So types of arteries, we have elastic arteries, and these are the ones with the largest diameter and the thickest walls. So examples of elastic arteries will be your aorta and your pulmonary trunk. These are also known as the great vessels that leave the heart. They have the thickest walls and the most elastic tissue in them because as your heart ejects and pumps blood out through, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, because of the pressure of the blood going through them, they need to be able to kind of hold that pressure. So they'll kind of stretch as the heart ejects blood and then come back. So these are elastic arteries, the largest in diameter. Elastic arteries eventually branch to form muscular arteries, which are medium to small size, they also are thick in diameter, but they will contain a lot of smooth muscle cells that will help to control blood flow to different body regions. So the muscular arteries are what most of your named arteries are in the body. So for example, you have an ulnar, radial artery, brachial artery, all different names of arteries going down your arms and your legs. They're all mostly muscular arteries and they, can, they all contain smooth muscle which allows them to constrict or kind of tighten up the amount of blood flow through them or dilate to allow more blood flow through them. And that's how they can control where the blood goes to different parts of the body. So here's an elastic artery. You can see the tunica intima. Tunica media is made up of a lot of elastic tissue in the tunica adventitia. And then here's your muscular arteries where we see um, kind of a very thick layer of tunica media where we have a lot of our smooth muscle and elastic tissue. So here are elastic arteries and muscular arteries. Then capillaries, blood will flow from arterioles, which are even smaller than medium arteries, into capillaries. And capillaries are branches of blood vessels that form networks Capillaries will connect your arterial artery side of things to the vein. So an arterial will flow blood into your capillary bed, and then the capillary bed will flow out into a venule to start our vein transition. Because at the area of this capillary bed, we have the kind of dumping off of oxygen and the pickup of waste products. So once blood flows through your capillaries, it changes will then change name to veins because after flowing through the capillary bed, these blood vessels, the veins, will return that blood back to the heart to try to get back into the pulmonary circulation to pick up oxygen again. So capillaries will branch to form different networks. Blood flow is regulated through capillaries by smooth muscle cells called precapillary sphincters. And this is very interesting. Blood flow is very controlled anywhere you go in the body, but especially within these capillary networks. And this is the direction of blood flow from the red arteries into the blue veins because in the capillary network, that is where oxygen will be offloaded and carbon dioxide or, carbon dioxide or other products is, um, is reloaded back into the blood. So that's why you see a color change Red blood vessels indicate that there's oxygen in them, and blue blood vessels indicate that the oxygen has been dumped off to the tissues that need it. These precapillary sphincters are very important. They control blood flow within these capillary beds, so they will kind of close off or shut off blood flow if that area of the body doesn't need oxygen at that time. Um, or they will open to allow blood flow into the capillaries uh, to offload oxygen or to pick up waste. So blood flow through capillaries is also very controlled. Here's a look at capillary structure. Because um, oxygen and carbon dioxide and other nutrients are going into and out of the capillaries, 
Capillary structure consists of just a very thin wall of simple endothelium. And that's so that different substances can easily flow into and out. If capillaries were very thick, it would be harder for oxygen to get out. But because capillaries are so thin, oxygen can readily diffuse right through the walls of those capillaries. So blood flows from the capillaries into the venules. And you can see this flow of blood here. So these were arterioles, which were even smaller arteries. And then blood flows through the capillaries into venules. The venules, now we've changed color to blue, no oxygen. And the venules will eventually form um, our small veins. The three tunics or layers are still present in all the small veins, but they're a little bit thinner because veins have thinner walls in general. Small veins will turn into medium-sized veins and medium-sized veins will eventually turn into large veins. Medium-sized veins will collect blood from the small veins to deliver to large veins. And large veins are important because they contain structures called valves. And I'll show you why valves are important. So this is just a fun picture. You can call it fun or interesting. Um, showing the walls of the blood vessels and how the walls change in thickness as you go from elastic arteries to mus muscular arteries to arterioles. You'll notice the tunics are much thinner. And then we get to a capillary, which is just is basically one cell layer thick, very thin going back into venules, which just contain a tunica intima layer. Small and medium veins contain all three tunics again, but they're all very thin. And then back into large veins, which again contain the three tunic layers, but just comparing the um, large vein to the elastic artery, you can see that elastic arteries walls are just much thicker in size. So in your large veins, we have what we call valves. And valves are very important to control blood flow and to help get blood back to the heart. Because remember, you know, if you think of blood or oxygenated blood that's been down at your feet, for example, how do your veins get blood from your feet back up to your heart? It's really hard, it's difficult. Valves help the direction of blood flow go against gravity. And there's, they're very common in the legs and even in the abdominal cavity to try to get blood back to the heart. So what happens is blood will flow up through a large vein. And once it gets up to this certain point, the valve will close to try to keep blood from flowing back down. Your veins are what we call the blood reservoir of the body. So at any given amount of time, most of the blood in your body is held within your veins and it's held just kind of waiting as it's working its way back up to the heart. So these valves will close, you know, at a certain level, let's say at your thigh level, to keep blood from flowing or pooling back down at your feet. Valves are important for blood return to the heart, you know, to close off and to keep the blood moving up. And also exercise is important because what exercise does, exercise, the muscles in your legs squeeze these veins together. And as it squeezes it, think of like a goat to get silly gopher tubes today. I don't know. But think of it like a squeezing action. When you exercise and contract your leg muscles, for example, that squeezes blood back up through the veins as well. So exercise is good for so many things. And one thing is just to help return blood back to the heart more easily, especially when, you're, when you think about your blood going against gravity and it needs to get back up to the heart pulmonary circulation. So let's go through how blood goes to and from the heart, or the lungs, excuse me, from the heart. So pulmonary circulation describes all the blood vessels that carry blood from your right ventricle, this will be deoxygenated blood, to the lungs where it picks up oxygen, and then back um, to the left atrium of the heart. The pulmonary trunk is the one of the great arterial blood vessels, one of your largest arteries, that blood will be pumped through from the right ventricle towards the lung. And then pulmonary veins will come out of the lungs and carry that oxygen-rich blood back to your left atrium. Remember that veins always carry blood to the heart, and the pulmonary veins are the only veins in the body 
that will carry oxygen-rich blood back to the heart uh, because they're returning blood from the lungs where it just recently picked up oxygen. Systemic circulation blood vessels have to do with carrying blood that's oxygenated from your left ventricle to all the systems or tissues of the body and then back to the right atrium after it's unloaded its oxygen to all the systems that need it. Oxygenated blood will pass from pulmonary veins back into the left atrium because that oxygenated blood came directly from the heart. Blood goes from your left atrium to the left ventricle and then from the left ventricle, blood is pumped very forcefully through your aorta and arteries will distribute blood as branches coming off the aorta to all systems and all portions of the body. So here's a look at blood flow through the circulation. Um, we have kind of pulmonary circulation shown in the middle, kind of on for going from the right side of the heart in blue, pulmonary arteries carrying deoxygenated blood to your lungs to pick up oxygen. And you can see these pulmonary capillaries there and then oxygenated blood flowing back through pulmonary veins to the left atrium into the left ventricle. And that's pulmonary circulation, blood going to and from the lungs to get oxygen. And then systemic circulation describes that oxygenated blood going out through the aorta, going up to the brain to offload oxygen, bringing oxygenated blood to your upper limbs, your abdominal digestive tract, um, and down to the lower limbs, and then back up to the heart after it's unloaded its oxygen in the capillaries and returning that deoxygenated blood back to the heart to start all over again. So again, your heart is like this two-sided pump. One pump is always pumping blood to lose oxygen. And the other pump is always pumping that oxygenated blood to all of your body's systems that need it. It's just so interesting and it's so cool to me, the heart and the circulatory system. And if, again, this is why if you have problems with your heart, you don't survive long because your heart is what controls this pumping to get oxygen and then to deliver it to all of your body tissues. And again, without oxygen, your body tissues cannot make ATP energy and you'll quickly die. So if you think about, you know, order of importance of organs in the body, the heart is probably way up there in one of your most important organs. You can't live really live long without any of them, but without the heart, um, problems will occur. Parts of your aorta, so this is the great blood vessel leaving the left ventricle filled with oxygenated blood. You have the ascending aorta that comes up from your left ventricle. You have the aortic arch, which is the part that curves around and then changes names into the descending aorta when it takes blood down to the lower half of the body. But off of the aortic arch, we have three major arteries that will carry all blood to the head and all of your upper limbs. And we'll go over kind of those parts of the aorta as shown here. The thoracic part of your aorta is, describes the descending aorta that goes through the thoracic region. So it travels kind of down behind your heart um, and through the diaphragm. But once it passes the diaphragm, which is what your, the muscle your lungs sit on, the descending aorta changes names to the abdominal aorta as it passes through the abdominal cavity. And the abdominal cavity is where it will give blood supply to all of the digestive tract organs, stomach, spleen, pancreas, large, small intestine. Eventually the abdominal aorta has to split because it needs to go down to your legs. And your abdominal aorta divides um, into what we call common iliac arteries. And common iliac arteries will be the beginning of the splitting that goes down into your lower legs. So here are major arteries of the body. And again, this is your intro to a &P course. If you guys are interested in this or thinking of the medical field for any reason, please take anatomy 150, 151, um, because you'll get into even more detail of learning this. And you'll just, yeah, the medical field is a great field to go into right now for job security. but especially if you're interested in it. But I bring that up because in those other classes, you'll learn more of these major arteries names. Um, we'll spend time in lab learning a lot of these major artery names when we get to cardiovascular system, 
But in general, you can see here, here's the arch of the aorta and how it goes down into the descending aorta. And then it will split into these common iliac arteries. You can see off this branch, um, and it might show, I don't have a really zoomed in look, but off of the aortic arch, you see kind of a branch going to the right limb, a branch up to the head and neck, and another branch going to the left limb. So those are the three branches that come off of your aorta to bring blood supply to the head and upper limbs, whereas the descending aorta will bring blood supply to the lower part of the body. Here are branches of the aorta. You can see a little bit better um, branches of the aorta as it descends. Here's the thoracic aorta. Then when it goes through the diaphragm, it changes names to the descending or abdominal aorta. And you can see branches going to the stomach, the large intestine, branches to the kidneys. Your kidneys filter all your blood. So you have really important arteries called renal arteries going to your kidneys. Um, you can see other branches off the aorta going between um, the rib cage. So lots of branches of the aorta. We'll go over some of these names in, uh, in lab and a little bit here in lecture two. So here are the three branches off the aortic arch that you should know. So remember the aortic arch is the part, part of the aorta that kind of curves. We have the brachiocephalic artery coming off first on the right side. And then we have a left common carotid artery and a left subclavian artery. The brachiocephalic artery is the first branch off the aortic arch, and it will supply blood to the right side of the head and the neck. The left common carotid artery is the second branch off the aortic arch, and it supplies blood to the left side of the neck and head. And then the left subclavian is the third branch off the aorta, and it supplies blood to the left upper limbs. Coming off of that brachiocephalic artery, then we have a right common carotid artery. Whenever you see the word carotid, that's an artery that goes up to the head and neck, and a right subclavian. Subclavian arteries always go to a limb, whether it's a right or left subclavian artery. So we can see a little bit here how the brachiocephalic artery, this is the first branch off the aortic arch. It will branch into a subclavian artery that goes to the right limb or this common carotid artery, which continues up to provide blood to the right side of the head and neck region. This is a look at the arterial cerebral circle. And within the brain, there's just a very unique kind of um, sharing and purposeful kind of distribution of blood to make sure it gets to all of your brain tissue. And we have what we call a circle of Willis. This is the cerebral arterial circle where you have blood vessels that create this kind of circular region where they're all connected and then blood vessels kind of come out of that circle. We have an anterior cerebral artery, anterior communicating artery, internal carotid artery, posterior communicating and posterior cerebral artery that all have to make the circle of the cerebral arterial circle of the circle of Willis. This basilar artery is the main artery that's kind of coming up the front side of the medulla oblongata. Um, but again, your artery supply to the brain is very intricate, very interesting because you want your brain and all brain tissues to get the artery, the blood supply it needs. Here is kind of, if you are more of a, maybe not a visual learner, but you're very analytical, this is a really nice chart describing the branches that come off of the aortic arch going up to the head and neck region. So we have the base brachiocephalic arteries, the first branch, the left common carotid, carotid arteries, the second branch, and then the left subclavian artery. This is the third branch coming off of the aortic arch. And then you can see how each of these kind of three major branches will go on to continue to branch to even more arteries as it brings blood supply to the other head, neck, and arm regions. So sometimes charts like these, people like to look at because it kind of takes out all of the artery pictures. And sometimes it's a lot to look at a person with all their arteries labeled. This just labels them with boxes and where these arteries go to. 
Then we have arteries of the upper limbs. The axillary artery, um, it goes through the auxilla or armpit region. And it's a continuation of your subclavian artery. Eventually came off, you know, that those branches off the aortic arch. And it will supply blood deep in the clavicle through the auxilla or your armpit region. The axillary artery changes names uh, to a brachial artery, which is just a continuation. Uh, this is usually where blood pressure measurements are taken. So the brachial artery goes through the upper half of your upper limb. And that's usually where the blood pressure cuff um, is used to take blood pressure measurements. And then the brachial artery will branch um, into an ulnar and a radial artery. The ulnar will go down the elbow to kind of the pinky side where your ulna bone is. And the radial branch will supply blood to the forearm and hand um, where kind of it'll go down your radial side. And this is can sometimes be where your pulse is taken. If you feel your pulse kind of at your wrist, you're most likely feeling pulsating blood uh, within the radial artery. So this is a look at arteries of the upper limb coming from brachiocephalic to subclavian, changing name to axillary, changing name to brachial, and then splitting into a radial and an ulnar branch. You can see that there's other branches coming off too, but this is kind of the main branching system as arteries go down into the upper limb, eventually into the digital arteries, which go to your fingers, and the arteries will make what we call arches within the palm of your hand as well. Abdominal aortic branches. And again, if you join us late, I'm going to get through about 40, 42 slides today. So, you know, there's a lot of information shown here. So we have branches of arteries coming off the abdominal aorta. So remember, this is the part of the aorta that's going through the abdomen. We have a celiac trunk artery, which it's called a trunk because it eventually divides into three main branches. But your celiac trunk arteries go to your stomach, pancreas, spleen, liver, the upper duodenum, which is your first part of the small intestine. The superior mesenteric artery supplies blood to the small intestines and the upper portion of the colon. And the inferior mesenteric artery supplies blood to your colon. And the colon is just another word for the large intestine. So if you hear of someone with colon cancer, it's cancer of the large intestine. And when we get to digestive system, we'll see those differences. More abdominal branches. The nice thing about the names of these is they'll tell you what they go to. So renal, that word always has to do with kidneys. So renal arteries take blood to the kidneys, hepatic, this word root, the H-E-P-A, HEPA, always refers to liver, whether it's a hepatocyte, hepatitis is inflammation of the liver, hepatic artery supplies blood to the liver, testicular artery goes to the testes, or ovarian arteries go to the ovaries. These are known as the gonadal arteries. So based on male, female, you'll have testicular arteries or ovarian arteries. Inferior phrenic arteries, the phrenic artery always goes to the diaphragm, and lumbar arteries will go to your lumbar vertebrae and some of your back muscles. Arteries of the pelvis, so remember we had our common, um, we kind of had our descending aorta going through the abdomen, uh, and then that abdominal aorta eventually branches into common iliac arteries as it starts to go to either limb. These common iliac arteries branch one more time into an external or an internal iliac. The external iliac will continue supplying blood to your lower limb. So your external iliac kind of just continues down the leg, whereas the internal iliac um, will be the branch that supplies blood to the pelvic area. So your internal iliac kind of changes direction. It goes into the pelvic area, supplies blood to your um, reproductive organs, your bladder. And again, these are the major arteries of the abdomen and pelvis. And instead of showing you a picture of you know, tons of arteries coming off the abdominal aorta, sometimes it's easier to look at kind of the words and just boxes and then where they go. Um, and then you can look at a picture of the arteries later, which we will do in lab. So these are major arteries of the abdomen and pelvis, the celiac trunk, inferior phrenic, what it goes to, superior mesenteric, you have suprarenal arteries, which go to your uh, renal, adrenal glands, 
re renal arteries go to the kidneys, gonadal arteries, testes or ovaries, lumbar arteries, the back um, and the abdominal wall, inferior mesenteric, and then you see the branching of the iliacs going from the common iliac and then to internal or external iliac. And then at the lower limb, um, the external iliac that kind of divided off of your abdominal aorta changes name into the femoral artery when it supplies the thigh region, your quadriceps muscles. Popliteal arteries supply blood to your knee. Popliteal is the knee region. We have anterior and posterior arteries supplying blood to the leg and foot. And fibular arteries supplying blood to the lateral leg and foot because that's where your fibula bone travels. So here we have kind of a branching of the abdominal aorta into a common iliac. The internal iliac is shown here, staying in the pelvis region. The external iliac continues down and changes name into femoral. And then eventually it goes to popliteal by the knee. We have anterior and posterior tibial arteries as it goes in front and behind the tibial bone. And the fibular artery goes on the lateral side of the lower leg by the fibula bone. Dorsalis pedis artery will then bring blood supply to the foot. And then we have veins. And maybe what we'll do is we will pause here. We're not quite halfway through, um, but this is a good place to pause our lecture for today. Um, and we'll finish up with veins and blood pressure on Monday. So I'll stop the recording and then I'll answer any.